my fear. <laughs> what motivates you? What motivates you? Please raise your hand if you know the answer to this question. Let me see those hands. All right. Madam President Lynn Sher, Madam CEO Pam Crook, diversity ambassadors, distinguished guests, and of course, Mr. Chris Nielsen, our presenter. Good afternoon. Chris has posed this question to our group. What motivates you? Hopefully by the end of this presentation, you can answer this question. Our agenda is posted in chat and so is our program. We are so excited for you to be here. We will have Chris present for half an hour and our fabulous, amazing diversity ambassadors will have a chance to share their thoughts and culture and information to you. And before that, my son will play us a tune that uh, he has uh, organized for us and he will be our timer. He will introduce our, himself and his role uh, later on. So I would like to turn over to my co-host, Darlene Meekins. Take it away, Darlene. Well, thank you, Rose, I appreciate that. And I have the honor of introducing Chris Nelson. Now, Chris has more than 30 years of business and sales experience. He combines this experience with his love of improv comedy to both entertain and educate the global audiences. He is a dynamic, powerful, yet playful speaker, a trainer, change facilitator, coach, and consultant. Chris masterfully engages envir uh, environments through games. Um, leaders and teams at Microsoft, Intuit, Hilton, Federal Reserve Bank, Sony, and many more have shared laughs and memorable experiences. Audience members walk away with tools to improve cooperation, communication, creativity, collaboration, and leadership in both their organizations and their lives. Let's give Chris a big hand. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. I look forward to serving this audience and, and thank you, Rose and Darlene, for bringing me in and having me, giving me this opportunity to be of service. And that's one of the things, one of my purposes in life, to uplift other people, uh, send positive ripples through the world. And I'm here to serve you in the best way I can in the limited amount of time we have today. And then saying that, I want to empower all of you off the bat. You have now all become empresses and emperors. You might feel the power and energy running through your body, going through the top of your head. You have that power in you. And what I mean by that, if you like something you hear, thumbs up as the emperor or empress. If you're not so sure that sideways thumb, and if you don't like it, give me the thumbs down. You know, I appreciate knowing I don't like that or I don't agree. And then I'm gonna say some things you probably won't agree with right away, maybe. If you love it, two thumbs up. And if I say something so bad, you want to cut my head off, boom, give me two, two thumbs down. So I want to empower my audience because I am here to serve you. If there's anything that I can add to your life that you see fits, please come off mute, raise your hand, put it in the chat and share that with me. I share a recipe for innovation, collaboration, connection, improved communications with all kinds of different organizations. From Alzheimer's San Diego, which I've worked with over 10 times, to some national ones helping caregivers better connect with their people, to my teams at Microsoft. And what I wanna share here today is this, I, in the past I was a mortgage broker, a really successful one. Uh, there was a poll that got me out of that to do something different. And I've worked with lots of realtors uh, through the years as well. Uh, I love helping people. So that's what I'm here to do. I'm gonna share some brief things with you kind of on my journey and I want to check in with you on something too. Uh, let me just say this. If you want to get more of what you want in a playful way, I'm going to share a recipe that's going to get more of what you want personally and professionally. And we'll do that in a fun, playful way. I also want to make this place perfectly safe. If we get a chance to play a couple of games, totally voluntary. You can watch your friends 
play these particular games if you want. And saying that, is there anything that pops in your head that you, you can tell I could bring to you? If you had a magic wand, what would you want right now? Feel free to put it in the chat or come off mute and say what that is. And as I, I wait and maybe see if there's any out there, I'll just put it this way. I was on a journey from a fearful speaker to one that has a ton of kids, grandkids. <laughs> Thank you, Rouse, for that. I, I don't know if I can personally help you. Maybe, actually, this recipe actually might be able to help with that, too. <laughs> when people have more fun together, maybe that, <laughs> that can happen, too. Uh, so as I share the recipe and you get in this playful idea, please keep an open mind to it. I've worked with a lot of teams. A lot of people come in very skeptical. And at the end, they go, oh, my gosh, that was so good. I can see how I can use that. And the recipe I share, well, actually, you can only, you can even, the cool thing about this recipe, you can use parts of it. And yes, Pam, I can give you more time in each day, actually more of a certain kind of time that adds to it. And you see if I live up to that promise, Pam. Now, as a speaker, health and love, actually, this recipe leads to more health and love. Thank you, thank you for that, Gabriella. Uh, more health and love as well. So you'll see if I uh, come through on that promise as well. In saying that, I'll just briefly say I went from a fearful speaker to one that has a ton of fun. And let me ask this in a playful way. How many of you know that you've been programmed? Give me a thumbs up if you know you've been programmed. <laughs> I'm seeing, oh, okay, a few. Okay, wave at me like this if you don't think you've been programmed. Oh, okay. All right, so I love that. Let's see if we can change your minds <laughs> on that one. Um, the, is a, is a part of this organization, is this organization programming you to think in a certain way, you know, your field programs you to deal with people, your, the company you work for programs you how to best deal with your clients and customers and services. You're programmed in school by your parents and not every program. So I'm not saying it's bad. We're all programmed. Some programs uplift us and some bring us down. I was programmed by a TV commercial. Never let them see you sweat. I can read Rose's lips. Sweat. Never let them see you sweat. And I sweat a lot. And, and because of that, I felt defective. And I knew that was one of my programs, that I felt defective. And in saying that, well, I didn't know until much later that, that how powerful it had a, an impact on me. Every time I'd get up to speak, I would do crazy things so you wouldn't see me sweat. Uh, I did this thing that I'll never do again. I half froze a bottle of water. So it was ice on the bottom and almost ice on top. And as I was being introduced to this important speech, uh, I put it on my back of my neck and that actually did work. I would do that again. But this is the part I wouldn't do. As she's finishing the introduction, as Darlene finished her introduction today, I did this. I took a huge swig. And when I started talking, my voice, uh, my tongue couldn't manipulate the words quite correctly. And I felt uh, all self-conscious because I was slowing my words and I started to pour sweat anyway. So I will not do that again. And in fact, I don't like ice water at big, cor big banquets and events like that before I speak as well. I would buy two shirts exactly the same. And if given the chance, I'd switch <laughs> out to the new fresh shirt before an event. My first improv show was probably about 11 years ago or so, maybe 12. I put an ice pack down my pants in the bathroom before and thinking, oh, they're going to see it there. So I put it in the back of my pants, both exhilarating experiences. Um, but I said, oh, what would be worse? <laughs> thank you for that, Pam. I love when people, I get people to cover their face like that. So thank you for any of the laughs. Um, I was in the bathroom and I was testing it out. I knew my improv teacher, Jackie Lowell, didn't like air conditioning. It was San Diego in December. And I so hoped it was a cool day, but it was 80 degrees that day. And it was so hot in that uh, senior center. Um, now, I was more worried that the ice pack would fall out during the show. So I didn't go on and do the show with the ice pack in there. <laughs> it went back in the cooler and I sweated through that show. But I wanted to tell you all some of the things I've been through. The last one I'll share is this. I bought panty liners. <laughs> I love, I love putting, yes, panty liners, and I put them in the armpits, and in practice, they worked great. I was moving around, I was sweating, and nothing was coming through. I thought, oh my gosh, maybe I even have an invention. And I walked into that speech with more confidence than I had in a long time. 
because I had my panty liners on. I was good to go. I was ready to speak. I could tell I was sweating a lot, but I thought in practice they worked great until I looked down and there was a big oh no and another big oh no because there was a dry panty liner island in a lake of sweat. Perfect outline, dry panty liner island, both arms. The rest of that speech I was like this. No, no arm, my arm movement was kind of like that. I didn't dare bring them up. And I wanted to share that to know where I've come from. I've reprogrammed myself in many ways to have more fun as a speaker. And I'll give you a, a last program for me that I changed that I should get some thumbs down to as well. Give me a thumbs down if you don't believe me on this. Um, I like to be wrong. I like to be wrong. Give me a thumbs down if you don't believe me. Give a thumbs up if you do believe me. Let's see who believes me. All right. I love this. Okay. A couple people believe me. I think Amy had some confidence in me and so did Marsha. Okay. All right. All right. And, and, and Marie. Excellent. So those that believe me, um, you are right. Because in, <laughs> it didn't used to be that way though. I used to hate to be wrong. And this might be one of your programs too. I hated to be wrong because if I was wrong out here, I was wrong in here. And I didn't know that was my program. Wrong about something on the outside, wrong on the inside. And so I hated it. Now I do this. I've reprogrammed that needing to be right to actually liking to be wrong because in that moment I get to learn something new. I no longer make myself as a being wrong. I don't think anyone can be wrong as a being. I think we're all equal in our beingness. We have different skills and talents and abilities, but we're all equal in beingness. So if I'm wrong about something out here, it doesn't make me wrong anymore. I get to learn, I'm super curious, and I get to expand. And that's why I love tapping into the wisdom of the audience. And so how, did I switch any of those people that were like this? Did I switch you over a little bit? Okay, yeah, all right. And here, I'll give you this too. I, I love the skepticism. Keep that skepticism, darling. Um, I'll also give you this. It felt like when I did this, taking off a 200 pound backpack of needing to be right that I didn't need to wear anymore. I could walk into rooms, this Zoom room, for example, and others so much more relaxed because my beingness wasn't on trial by me. And in saying that, I want you to point to the most dangerous person in this Zoom room to you. Who's the most dangerous to you? Yes, thank you, Scott, for that. Uh, yeah, some people got it. It's us when we say something. Oh, <laughs> and Rose is pointing to everyone and then back to herself. Uh, what I get is this. When we, and someone says something mean to us, if we go, that's not true, or that is true, no big deal. But if when we repeat it one, ten, a hundred, a thousand times to ourselves, that's when we make ourselves really miserable. So I'm glad uh, you, the cool thing about this, I was programmed in needing to be right. I reprogrammed in liking to be wrong because it opens, it, it expands me. And it took multiple little programs in there. Once you have awareness of a particular program, you can choose to change it if you want. And I'm going to share with you right now a cool recipe that lots of organizations appreciate. If you want more engagement from the people you work with, play with, or even in your personal life, this is a great recipe for that. It's also, it's not that one. That's not part of the recipe. <laughs> this, this is the recipe right here that I share. And I'm going to share it in a fun, playful way with you in terms of this. Uh, I know we have a limited time, so I'm probably going to go pretty quick, but I love funny guesses. So if you have a funny guess on anything or a bad guess, please do it. I'm going to start with number six. And let me ask you, as I start with number six instead of number one, who does that bother? Wave at me like this if that bothers you a little bit. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you, Marsha, for that. Um, and and I, some people, I, I, when some groups, when I'm in uh, like engineers and CPAs, it bothers pretty much the whole group. <laughs> now, Starting at number, and that's just a program we have. We're programmed in a certain way to it. I follow tangents, so Marsha, I have to apologize to you right, right now. I will follow a few tangents. Um, but number six is this. It comes from Google's Project Aristotle and my experience in improv at what makes successful teams. And we could spend all day on this particular one if you figure it out. Um, Google's Project Aristotle said the number one factor in a high performance team was what? Does anyone know what it is? And feel free to come off mute or share it in the chat. I would, uh, Marcia. Create a plan. 
Create a plan is good, and, and I think that comes from part of it. It leads to uh, what this is. Anyone else? I love the guess. How about an open environment? Create an open are... environment. I think this is both of those things are probably involved in the actual delivery of this. Anyone else? All right. I'm going to share it with you. Uh, create a psychologically safe environment or psychological safety was Google's project Aristotle. I say create a safe environment, safe environment. And I'll have this screen filled in in a minute. So you feel free to take a screenshot or take notes, either one. Uh, what I mean by what they mean by psychological safety is this ideas still get bloodied, but people don't ideas get uh, maybe attacked or looked at in serious ways, but people do not get attacked. So they feel safe in expressing their ideas. They don't take, they don't make their ideas part of them. And that's probably part of the world's problem right now. It's too many people have sewn their ideas into their skin. So when you touch on their ideas, it feels like you're touching, you're hurting them personally. And that's another deeper conversation as well. But how do you create a safe environment? So with, when you're with a client customer or organization that you work for now, how do you make it safe? And I say this, some people are concrete organizations and people, and some people are net organizations and people. So what are you? Are you concrete or net? And what I mean by that, if you're learning something new, like getting on the trapeze of whatever new skill it is, will you take a risk and reach for that other one and fall into a net and climb back up and do it again? Or will you fall on concrete and go, ah, oh, that's, I'm done doing that. You know, I'm doing that around them or in their organization. So how can you create a safe environment? And this works at home, work and play this particular recipe. I'm gonna go to number five very quickly. Dare to blank. My improv teacher, Jackie Lowell, the one who wouldn't turn the air conditioner on said, the secret to success in improv and life is this. And when she said it, I said, no, thank you. Let it be something else. Dare to blank. Any guesses what dare to blank would be? Say Fail. yes. I dare to say yes. I would say yes. What was that? What was the other one? Fail. Dare to fail. fail. You just threw a dart right next to the bullseye. She just used a more graphic word. Any other guesses? And you can wave at me like this if you want me to give it to you. <laughs> All right, <laughs> darling, get ready for me to move. She said, dare to suck. And I said, no, thank you. But people in the room were giddy. They're going, yes, this was in the improv class. They were shaking their head, yes, or almost floating out of their seats so happy. And I was going, no way, because if I fought, if I failed at something out here, I felt like the failure in here. If I sucked publicly or uh, just crashed and burned, I would feel like that inside, and I didn't want to feel like that. And there's no way I want to do that. Eventually, I realized the power of it. Since then, I've even done a keynote called Dare to Suck, because what I realized is this. If you really want to succeed, you have to fail. If you want to dare to suck seed, you got to dare to suck first. And I use a simple example of this. Does everyone know who Babe Ruth is? Wave your hand if you don't know who Babe Ruth is. Uh, okay, Babe Ruth was, I'll, I'll tell it really fast. Babe Ruth was the king of home runs way back, I think, in the 20s or right around their 1920s in baseball. He hit more home runs than any hitter in history. He was, listen, he was famous. He was a salt in the swat. He's still been famous for years. He had 714 home runs. Does anyone know how many strikeouts he had? 1,330. He was also the king of strikeouts. And in speaking, I said to myself, what am I willing, Chris, what are you willing to fail at 1,330 times to be at the top of your game? As I started this talk, I created a group called Speaker Skills Plus for me personally. I want to be one of the best speakers in the world. I'm still a work in progress on that. And we work on storytelling and other things in that group. But one of the mottos of that group is this, be willing to be bad over and over again so you can eventually be great. Be willing to be bad over and over again so you can eventually be great. And to do that, you got to create that safe environment. If you don't have that safe environment, if you don't have the safety net built in here, when we're hard on ourselves, when we're our worst enemy, sometimes we don't have the safety net built in our head. If we're not in an environment where have it, we can't take the risk to get better. So how to dare to suck has a really power and energy into it. And in fact, um, has anyone heard of Sarah Blakely? Anyone heard of Sarah Blakely? Okay, some heads, the, the billionaire founder of Spanx. 
And her, does anyone know the ritual her dad gave them around the dining room table that she said was the secret to her success? Does anyone know that ritual? Okay. She would, they, they, Darlene, do you have it? Um, I'm not sure, but yes. I think they used to talk about their failures around the table. Yes. So the dad had to ask them, what's your best failure of the day? And they felt like a failure if they didn't have a failure. So the kids, both her brother and her, were pushed to take risks. Because failure failure in a moment doesn't mean failure overall. In fact, if you want to get great at something, you have to take a risk of fail. I'm going to jump up to the top of this. The two-word basis of improv comedy is... Anyone know? Oh, so yeah, oh, Richard knows... Richard's got it in the chat. Where are you, Richard, on the screen? Wave at me, Richard. Oh, there you are. Yes. Thank you, Richard. Yes, and. Thank you, Richard, for that. To yes, and to affirm an ad. Now, I worked with I worked with a lot of CEOs. And one CEO, his uh, vice president, she came to him with the yes, and idea, said, All right, let's play with this. And they started to play with it between the two of them. And then they turned it into the whole company mantra. And from eight years, he went from an eight, a $400 sale to selling his company for multiple, multiple millions of dollars in eight years with the yes and motto. Now that doesn't attribute everything, but he attributes a lot of his innovation and success and connection and keeping his best people to the yes and mantra. Number two, I have to say this, it's the number one skill as a realtor, a number one skill in negotiation, number one skill in sales, number one skill in leadership, Number one skill in uh, relationships. Any guesses what that skill is? Listening. Yes. Marsha. <laughs> and Pam. Listening. Pam, do you got it? Oh, can, can you hear com me? Confidence. Confidence helps, yes. What else? <clears throat> I was going to say listening skills. I would say you're absolutely right in terms of this. And let's test. And I know I saw it in the chat, too. I want to ignore it for a second. Carol had it right away. R nicely done, Carol. Uh, listen. And who would agree uh, that listen is the number one skill in sales, negotiation, uh, as a real estate agent, in your relationships? Give me a thumbs up if you agree or wave at me if you agree. Okay, yes. Yes. Okay. I see it. Um, now, there's a lot of other skills that make it up, but I think it's the most important one. Because sometimes when you're listening, you hear things that even that they're not even saying, you're listening to their body language. Like I have you all in gallery mode right now. I'm, is, I love the facial expressions and involvedness of this group. Now, number three is the magic blank. And we mentioned it a little bit earlier, how we can change time. So I'll give you more time in this way. Number three is the magic in so many ways. It boosts your listening skills. So what would boost your listening skills? What would boost your listening skills? Yes, Marsha, and then- My first thought is eye contact. Eye contact definitely boosts your listening skills. So there's a lot of right answers for boosting listening skills. Eye contact definitely does because then you're focused, you're with that person. Darlene. Practice. Practice, <laughs> practice listening actually does help. Actually for me, um, uh, saying yes and required me to listen. If I wanted to affirm and add to what my partner said, I needed to listen. Good observer, absolutely, Gabriella. Good listener needs to to make a difference. It'll help you be a good listener. What else? Be present. Oh, who is that, Sue? Yes. Uh, let, uh, I would love to see Sue's magical face with that. This is the magical blank in terms of this. Be present. And let me see from the emperors and empresses out there, put, give me a thumbs up if being present would boost your listening skills. Yeah, thumbs popping all over the place. Being present, here's where the magic in, and it gives you more time. I think it slows down time in some places. When you are present with someone, it's a gift. It's also a gift to me as a speaker. I was miserable as a speaker, even thinking about speeches ahead of time. I'd be worried. I'd be freaked out. I'd be in my head. Most fear is the projection of things going wrong into the future. When you are present, fear disappears like mist on a sunny day. As the sun, the more present you are, the more the sun comes out, and the more that mist just disappears. Present is the magical blank. 
And so let me test, you'll see this group. If someone yes anded you, they said yes to whatever you, whatever offer you gave and added to that, lifted you up with that, they were listening to you and present with you, would that feel like a gift? Give me a thumbs up if that would feel like a gift. Can all of us do it better? I can do it better. Wave your hand like this if you think you can do those things better, those three things. Excellent. I think we all can do those three things better. And the more we improve on that, the more gifts we give to others. And here's the cool thing about that. When you yes and another human being, when you listen with presence to another human being, you are also giving yourself a gift. Give me a thumbs up if you would agree with that too. Yeah, it feels good to be present. That's when the time matters. So for some people, if you're never present in your relationships, you can feel it. You're just so busy. You got so many tasks to do. It feels you don't like have enough time, but you get present with some, someone fully. There's magic that happens both ways. It's like a connection, energy connection. And one of the, my compass questions as a, a speaker, trainer, and coach is that, are you connecting or are you disconnecting? It's a question I ask myself, am I connecting in this moment or am I disconnecting? Because when we're connected, people will go the extra mile or 10 miles for us. Now, even when we're not looking, if you're really connected to a client or a prospect, they're probably going to become your client or more likely to. If you're disconnected, it's much more difficult. And here's the visual image I want to give you. <clears throat> Would you ever be in such a rush um, that to vacuum a room that you don't bother plugging it in? You know, it's too hard to uncoil that cord. Uh, I just, I'm going to just go do it. I'm going to push it around. You would never do that. You got to connect into power first. As you connect into a relationship first, the power of that. And this is an incredibly connecting recipe. Yes, and listen, be present. Now, number four also came from improv that made me change significantly. And I say, yes, and I was a no, but person. You'd share an idea. I'd say, no, but I got a better idea. And I didn't realize how incredibly disconnecting that was. Number four is make your blank look blank. And it's not make your face look interested or make your underwear look clean. Your underwear should be clean. <laughs> um, any guesses on what number four is? Make your team look good. Uh, Richard, that is basically it. Uh, I, I make your bad. Yeah, thank you, Gabriella. <laughs> I love when people like make me laugh. Yes, make your bed look great. And here's what the here's I'll fill in the blanks for you. And Richard got it basically right as I share it. Feel free to take a screenshot of that as you better. Make your people look great is how I put it. And who are your people? Your people are your prospects, your clients, your coworkers, your customers, your boss, um, your associate members, uh, your significant other, your spouse, your kids, your friends, your family, the grocery store clerk. They're whoever you're in front of. This is a recipe to play with in life. And I, when people say, how can improv affect life? Let me ask you, has anyone gotten their script today? Anyone gotten your script today? Wave at me if you got a script to you know your next line. <laughs> Rose knows her next line. Excellent. Um, what I say is life is improv. This is just another way to play it. And I'll ask you just really fast. How many of you would like the people in your life to yes and you, listen to you, be present with you and set you up to look good? Give me a thumbs up if you would like that. Give me two thumbs up if you would love that. Yes. Now, here's the cool thing. Now, I'm going to flip it on, on you in an empowering way because we can't control what other people do, but we can control what we do. How many of the people in your life, one thumb of it's just a couple, two of you if you think pretty much everyone would love you to be like this. How many of your friends, family, coworkers, clients, uh, prospects would love you to yes and them, listen to them, be present with them, and make them look great? Give me one thought. Yes, thank you, Darlene, for that. Yeah, they would love us to do that. And here's the cool thing. We can do that. And if you even play with part of this recipe, it's going to improve your connection skills. And when you improve your connection skills, you're going to get more of what you want in life. If you want to be, I mean, if one of the things, the reason I got into a speaker as a mortgage broker, because I wanted to speak to more than just one prospect at a time. I wanted to speak to lots of people at a time. As in, in the business you're in, you're all public professional speakers. 
You just might not be as good at it as you want to be at this time. I'm not as good as I want to be at this time. I'm always looking to be better. This recipe leads to flexibility, creativity, and connection between people. Collaboration is so powerfully different. To yes and listen, be present, make someone look great. There's so much power and energy that, and that it's incredible. Um, any questions on this recipe that I shared? And I know we only have what I have only about five more minutes. Is that correct? Okay. Any questions? I would love to hear from people in the chat how they might use this. And I'll go into a simple exercise that is totally volunteer. Two exercises that we can play. One is, uh, and it's called the first improv class I took felt like it might be my last because of this critical voice in my head. The last game, I'd survived every game, and I go, this is fun, I'm probably going to come back. But the last game made me think that maybe I'm not meant to do improv. And, and in that, um, the game was called Pass the Object. Jackie Lowell gave our group a white toilet brush. She said it was new, it looked new, but it did not have a tag on it, so I was a little bit skeptical of that. Um, people turned it into something cool, and the idea of the game is to turn this object into something that it isn't. So people turned it into a butterfly net. Oh, I could see that's clever. I could see the toilet brush become a butterfly net, a tennis racket, a badminton racket. And I was freaking out, breathing in the fear zone, barely taking a deep breath because nothing was coming in my head and a voice was saying, maybe you're not meant to do improv. And what I know is you are all out there infinitely creative. You probably haven't used your creative muscle as much lately, a lot of you, but you're all infinitely creative. I finally, an idea popped in my head, canoe paddle. I'm going to survive this game with a canoe paddle. <laughs> and uh, the person next to me said canoe paddle as they handed me the toilet brush and I freaked out. The voice said, I told you, I had nothing, 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 nothing until I started brushing my teeth with a toilet brush and people groaned and laughed and I let go and I would come back again and again and again because of that. And what I learned is one really important thing from there. You gotta have two things, <laughs> just in case. And for the longest time I wasn't, but number three, the magic blank of being present. That's why now I have a ton of fun speaking. In the past, it was after a speech when I finally got to sit down that I could finally take a deep breath and relax. Now it's during, because there's magic in being present with all of you. There's magic in being present with another human being. And I hope you play with that recipe in this. And everyone grab a pen that wants to play this game, we're going to turn our pen into something that it isn't. Your first improv game for some of you. And the idea in here, sound effects are optional. Raise your hand if you want to share it. That's my uh, brilliant lightsaber. I'm sure you could feel the Jedi Force running powerfully within me. Or a simple Q-tip. So raise your hand, come off mute, and show me what you can turn your pen into. And look at it from a different directions. Scott's ready to go. What do you got, Scott? Rocket ship. It's a rocket ship. Yes. Thank you for that, Scott. Who else we got something? Don't be shy, people. Dare to. S yes, Richard has got binoculars. Binoculars. And he's holding it. I love it. That's the first time I got binoculars holding the pen there. Very good, Richard. Love it. <laughs> Who else has got something out there? Come on, creative people. You are infinitely creative. I know you are. Uh, Darlene, what do you got? This is my magic wand. You know, like Bewitch, she twinkled yeah. her nose. I got my wand and I just make the day whatever I want it to be. <laughs> I love that. You have a magic wand in your hand when you're a pen. What else can you turn that thing into? A hairpin. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Gabriella. A hairpin. What else? What else? A weapon. It could be, yes, it could be a weapon. I'm, 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 I'll duel you. Rose, what else could it be turned into? All right, well, do my baton. Ready? All through your fingers, right? Twirl nice. it. Be in the parade. <laughs> yep, baton in the parade. Uh, Robert, you're muted, but I saw it turn into something there. What do you got, Robert? Mute. And Richard is directing us all. Thank you, Richard, for that. <laughs> Musically directing us. Thank you. All right, is Robert finds that mute button. Uh, Scott's got something again. I got a magic pen. It, it writes every different color. Okay, there. can you hear me? Uh, yeah, very nice. <laughs> oh, Scott, friend. I love humorous. Now we can hear you, Robert. What do you got? And then Marsha. The best friend. 
<laughs> oh, it's your best friend. <laughs> nice. I love it. Marsha, did you have anything there? It is a fishing rod, I'm guessing, but I'm not sure. You're muted, Marsha. Hey, yes, Vincent, it's a dart. And go fishing with my grandson. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. I know we're running at time. Are we at that number that we need to wrap this baby up? I think we are. Uh, what I want to say is I just gave you a taste of what this is, and I hope you play with this recipe on a regular basis. Um, please reach out and connect with me. I love serving organizations. Um, Rose is phenomenal. Um, I've worked with her now. This is the second time. She's amazing. Give it up to her. Thank you for bringing me in, Rose. And Darlene, I so appreciate both of you. This recipe changed my life. It took me from a no but person to a yes and person. Yes and feels positively in connecting. It made me a better listener. And being present brought more magic back into my life. It was like I had my own magic wand. The more present you are, the more powerful it can be for you. Setting up other people to look great wasn't in what I did on a regular basis. But I have a mom that was a high school counselor that changed so many lives. At my 20 reunion, so many people said she saved my life. She got me off drugs and alcohol. She's the reason I graduated. She's the reason I became a counselor. I realized I wanted to give more into the world. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Give me a thumbs up or two thumbs up if you got value from this today. Uh, please play with this. Reach out to me and tell me how you're playing with this. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chris Nielsen. Everyone, give him a round of applause, please. Thank I you. know uh, I've heard this before, but listening to it again is still not enough. I need to listen, uh, listen to this uh, over and over again, because uh, even though you know it, you still have to practice it to make it part of you, like muscle memory. So thank you very much, Chris, for a wonderful presentation. Thank Everyone. You. Let's turn the stage over to my son, Richard Yuan, so he can give us some music uh, break uh, so that we can give Chris a chance to change his shirt. All right. <laughs> uh, take it away, Richard. Good afternoon, everyone. What a fantastic discussion led by Mr. Nielsen uh, in terms of using what he taught us today, hopefully give you some joy uh, some holiday spirit going into a hard time for the last couple of years of course with the uh, pandemic hopefully we can look forward to this holiday season in an uplifting way like he would say and turn our attention to positivity and this is fly me to the moon Fly me to the moon and let me play among the stars. Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. In other words, hold my hand. In other words, baby. Kiss me. Fill my heart with song and let me sing forevermore. For all I long for, all I worship and adore. In other words, please be true. In other words, I love.
my heart with song and let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for, all I worship and adore. In other words, hold my hand. In other words, I love. and uh, happy holidays. So moving on, uh, my mom's gonna introduce my next role. Yes, we will have our diversity ambassadors uh, say a few words. However, we we're, have a very tight schedule so that he, Richard will be our timer. And Richard, please explain your role, please. All right, so simply enough, going to be the timer today. As you can see, I'm going to cover my camera. And if you look for me, you will see the timer uh, word. And for your speeches, at the two minute mark, I will show this green window. For the 2.30 mark, I will show the yellow window. And for the three minute mark, I will show the red window. Now we're running a little bit tighter on schedule than we initially anticipated. So I hope that you round up your speech or wrap up around the green to yellow mark rather than the red. Thank you very much, Richard. So everybody, I'm, raise your hand if you understand the timer part, so that way we don't go over time and give everybody a chance to speak. On the program, we have uh, seven people. Unfortunately, two people cannot make it. I just got the text. Uh, so we will go with Gabriella Harris. Gabri Gabriella, are you there? Are you ready? If you can unmute and start when you're ready, please, to share with us. Oh. Uh... I don't know. It's, it's really nice to be part of this committee, especially after all these, these two years that we have been uh, isolated. Uh, for me, it's difficult to be, I'm the only one who's um, here from my family and I was used to get uh, really big uh, family dinners. And uh, these last two years have been just uh, me, my husband and my our, our three daughters, but uh, I did uh, took time to write some appetizer, uh, an appetizer recipe to share with everybody. And uh, I'm glad we have this, this group uh, because I think it was really needed. I find that a lot of our clients, especially if they immigrate from other places, they don't know their rights. And, and most of the times when somebody commits some unjust to them, they don't know that they can complain. They don't know what can they expect. And it was really important for me to be part of this group. Thank you. So that, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gabriela. Okay. May I also have Lydia of Francesca. Is that pronounced correctly? Can you unmute please? Of Francesca. Yes. Oh, one second. Thank you. Well, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'm, happy holidays to everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Rose, for asking me to bring some similarities of what we do over the holidays in Puerto Rico. So some of the similarities, and I am not a speaker like Chris, and I'm not a musician like Richard, but I want to share some of the things that are typical from Puerto Rico. And one of them is our pava. We use this uh, just over the holidays, uh, sometimes to bring our culture uh, the same way that we use the Santa hat here. Um, uh, Puerto Rico take pride to have the longest uh, uh, holidays in uh, the world. Um, they last 45 days right after you finish Thanksgiving. You finish your last plate of turkey until mid-January. Uh, we finish with what is called Las Fiestas de San Sebastián, which is a very big parade in San Juan where everybody play music. Uh, they play um, guitars and they, it's all about festiv the festivities. 
we also have a few traditions um, we like to, to decorate and we use um, ponytails. We do this, we have some similarities because we're part of the United States. So we celebrate Santa uh, at the same time that we celebrate Navidad, which is um, our Boricua version of Christmas. Um, one of the things that we do a lot and uh, is that we do parandas is a similar, very similar to the Christmas carol with the, um, we just gather and we're going to friends with guitars, with wheels. This is a wheel for those that do not know and maracas. And we go going very quietly because the idea is to surprise someone that is sleeping and gather with us to go to another house. We get refreshments there, like our coquito is similar to eggnog, but with coconut. And we also celebrate um, the tricking days in, that's January 6th. Um, usually kids, gather some hay and some grass, put it under the table, under the bed, and they exchange gifts um, th for, for the grass that they are leaving to the camels. Um, on Christmas Eve, we get together with our family, we have dinner and my time is over. So I wish next person can bring some of the uh, similarities as well. Thank you very much, Nidia. You brought out the whole shebang. We love it. It's like a show and tell. <laughs> Amazing. Muchas gracias. De nada. <laughs> our next speaker is Kara Barroca. She's our treasurer at Big Car. Carol, please uh, unmute and share with us something. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, I, I want to uh, start by uh, giving you a little bit of history about my family as I lead you into Christmas food uh, traditions. Uh, my mother was originally from Upper New York State. My father was from the Deep South. They met in Philadelphia, and they also eloped from 30th Street train station in Philadelphia during the war, during World War II. And that elopement became a tradition <laughs> of elopements of our family, but that's something I won't talk about here because we're focusing on Christmas food traditions. Because my relatives live far away, either upper New York State or in the South, our Christmas is centered, centered on the, my immediate family. Our Christmas Eves were very special and festive. Um, our Christmas preparations were done early so we could enjoy family parties on Christmas Eve. As kids, we were always making some sort of Christmas craft, whether it was making ornaments for the tree or constructing new stockings to put by the chimney. My mother always made special appetizers. Shrimp was without exception the centerpiece. Um, the, uh, every year she made Hungarian nut-filled rugula cookies, which were quickly devoured by everybody. So they, this is a, a rugula. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have time to make them this year. So this one came from our bakery, Kramer's, which is a wonderful bakery. Um, it's a time-consuming recipe, but every morsel was de uh, delicious. And it's a recipe that comes from her family. Her parents had come from Hungary, from Hungary to the United States in the early 20th century. My father also got into the kitchen during the holidays and made an incredible chocolate fudge for Christmas Eve. Um, he was an expert at making the fudge and although he passed the recipe on to all of us four kids, no one's able to match his fudge making skills. It may be that maybe an ingredient was missing, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, these three foods were always a part of our Christmas Eve celebrations. We ended the evening uh, by leaving cookies, milk, and a pipe for Santa. On Christmas day, my mother made a festive Christmas dinner for everyone, and beef was usually the main entree. Fast forward several years, I married a man from the Midwest. He had no relatives in the area, so we continued the tradition of family celebration, including uh, close friends um, with a Christmas Eve party and holiday dinner. Um, always lots of appetizers, lots of Hungarian nut rolls. The dinner is always a sumptuous version, uh, sumptuous version of roast beef or beef filet. Um, and Christmas day was spent opening and enjoying our gifts and our immediate family, no visitors, no schedule. And it was always, we would say is the best day of the year and the most relaxing day as we feast on love, laughing and food. 
Thank you very much, Carol. I love it. And, and just talking about foods making me hungry. Uh, you shared on in chat the chorag. Is that how I pronounce it? Chorag? Is that in Hungarian nut roll? So it's arugula. 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 Oh, okay, okay. Okay, arugula. Yes. And that the, the bakery is called Kramer's. You, you gotta send us where, where it's located. So I can head down there later on and get some, some good uh, arugula. Kramer's uh, in Yardley, I will. Oh, it's in Yardley. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you can share that later. Uh, at the end of the program, we will have the recipes that uh, people shared in chat and a recording uh, later on. So that way we can share with everyone. Uh, our next speaker, I can't wait to hear this. Marsha, can you unmute and share with us something, please? Okay. Um, I grew up in a Jewish home, so we celebrated Hanukkah, lit menorahs. Um, here's one of mine. Um, I have my mother's original uh, that I don't really use anymore because it's broken, but I can't part with it. Um, when we lit the candles, what my memory is all my friends, Catholic friends, Presbyterian friends, all my neighbors, all the kids would come over and light the candles with us. And we followed when I married, I married someone who was not Jewish. So we, we celebrated all holidays um, completely. And my kids brought their friends to light the candles with us. So that's one of our traditions now, um, bringing other people into our homes to help light the candles. My Christmas memory as a kid was going Christmas Eve when my neighbors went to midnight mass, my dad would go and put all their toys together for them. And I used to fall asleep watching the bubble lights on the tree. Um, now, with my husband, he, we decorated for both Hanukkah and Christmas. I did the cooking, he did the decorating. Um, and I love baking. I'm still making like about 20 different kinds of cookies, rugula being one of them. Um, so I bring Christmas Day, I always made a kugel for Christmas, which is a traditional Jewish food, Jewish dish. It's a noodle pudding. So I've always combined both religions through food <laughs> and, and family and friends. My, my mother could never come to my house Christmas time. It was too hard for her, but she sent her friends to come. So I don't want to take up more time, but now my son and daughter-in-law are the ones hosting and I'm still baking for it though. So. Thank you very much, Marsha. Uh, hopefully things will turn for the better and I'm, I will wait for my invitation for dinner, Marsha. <laughs> okay. I know I'm gonna like help myself to your uh, wonderful uh, home cooked meals uh, to introduce and then I can introduce you to Vietnamese yes. slash Asian food, fusion food. <laughs> Would love it. Would love that. Thank you. And our last but not least speaker, Amy Britt, can you unmute and say a few words, please? Okay, can you hear me? All right, so Christmas in my family has always been celebrated with food. That's kind of how we all show our love. And when my children were little, we started a tradition of going up to Jim Thorpe and we would get onto an old fashioned steam train and Santa would be there and there would be hot chocolate afterwards. And it was just wonderful. And family of uh, groups of our friends would join us and it actually wound up being like a 20 year tradition. We literally, my kids are in their thirties just recently stopped going. So, um, but more important than that would be bringing in the traditional foods that my grandmoms used to make. So my grandma Angel always made a baked macaroni and cheese. So delicious to die for. I'm, that's requested every Christmas Eve at my husband's uh, family party. And my mom always made a pineapple pudding, which we have 
also on Christmas Eve. Um, when my children are all coming home and it doesn't happen often, I have four children and only rarely are we all together. So I always make a big pot of meatballs and sausage and my sauce and so that the kids can just eat that the whole time that they're here. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. My one son is always trying different things. So every year now, since they've been adults, we've been incorporating something new. Like the last year, um, my son made a fennel salad for all of us to start Christmas with. We had never really had that before. But this year, what we're gonna do is we're going to compare and contrast two Italian desserts. So I have the panettone. So it is like a bread-like cake with a fruit. It's a little bit dry, delicious with butter. Um, and then there is the pandoro, which is celebrated in a different part of Italy than the panettone. So this one, it's very deep buttery flavor. So today, this year, we're gonna cut them both. And maybe next year when we do this, I'll let you know which one wins. So back to you, Rose. Thank you very much, Amy. All this talk about food, I am starving. Raise your hand if you're starving like me. Wow. I can't wait. I'm going to gain 10 pounds this holiday. <laughs> I have already. Oh, you already started. <laughs> then I have to catch up to you. Uh, we're at about, well, we're making good time. We have three minutes left. So I would like to turn this meeting over to our CEO, Pam, to give us the final celebratory toast to wish us well. Uh, Please give a round of applause for our CEO, Madame. Gosh. Well, I, I just want to thank Rose. Uh, Rose always brings a great team together. She always does. And, and I appreciate all of you and all of the work that you do throughout the year for our association, for your communities. Uh, realtors work so very hard for their clients, but also for the community. And I think it's unheralded many times. So on behalf of the community, I'm saying thank you to all of you. And uh, I hope all of you have a, a lovely holiday, however you celebrate it, however you celebrate it, just uh, concentrate on celebrating, right? So here, here, here's to all of you, to my realtor friends. Yes. Happy Cheers, holidays. Cheers, everyone. Happy holidays and happy new year. Thank happy you. Year. Thank, Thank you, Chris. You. Happy you know. Merry Christmas. 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 It was wonderful. Bye, everyone. I'm happy I got to introduce you. We're, we're closing. Thank everybody. you, everybody. Bye. Cheers. Cheers. Happy yeah. holidays, everyone. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you.